99.5 KKLA Los Angeles and on the web at KKLA.com. This is the Frank Sontag Show. A very good Thursday afternoon to you and yours. Every once in a while, we have the good fortune of meeting someone that, to say the least, has had a very interesting life and is here to talk about it. Gentleman in studio with me was the first captain on the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics back in the 1970s. He also is a graduate of the DEA Academy in Washington during the early days of President Nixon's first drug wars. He has recently released a book entitled A Ghostly Shade of Pale, which is inspired by his experiences. Merle Temple, welcome to the Frank Sontag Show here on 99.5 KKLA. Well, thanks, Frank. I'm glad to be here. Now, you have written quite a book. It is uh, uh, presented under the notion of fiction, and yet some of these stories I've kind of heard may be true. Well, it is fiction, uh, but it is uh, based on, or loosely based on, things that happened uh, to me back in those days uh, in the first drug wars. Fresh out of Ole Miss, and I emphasize the word fresh, wet behind the ears, <laughs> naive. We weren't prepared for what we were getting into, but uh, President Nixon had just declared the first war on drugs. So I went right into the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics, which had just been formed, and uh, it was uh, it was a rich time to to, to live through, uh, especially a rich time to draw from as an author. Uh, and so the good, the bad, and the tragic are all great fodder for a writer. Now, I obviously want to get into the book a little later. You said you wanted to write a Christian book that was good enough to attract the attention of the secular world. Tell us a bit about some of the more harrowing things you've been through in the DEA and your work as a narcotics officer. To say the least, your life has been in danger more than a time or two, is putting it mildly. Well, yes, and we were, uh, there weren't many of us uh, in the agency in those first days, and so we went deep undercover into what was the emerging uh, drug sub- subculture in those days, and often worked solo. And uh, in one such case, I was uh, taken hostage by some heroin dealers who had just decided that uh, uh, they had a better plan. Their plan was not to sell me their heroin, it was just to uh, kill me, take my money, and keep their heroin. And uh, so I was held hostage uh, for about six hours as, as they uh, debated uh, where to dump my body uh, after they had killed me. And uh, during that process, I guess to impress me, like I needed impressing any, anymore, oh, really? uh, one uh, actually ate double-edged uh, Gillette razor blades, chewed them up, swallowed them. Uh, he blo- ate them? He ate them and swallowed them. It, it cut him up really bad, uh, badly, and, and good blushed out uh, or, or gushed out from each corner of his mouth, ran down on his throat, and he put his hand back up in his mouth and got a finger full of blood and asked me if I wanted some. I told him I didn't believe I'd care for any. And then he <laughs> took a whole box of long stem kitchen matches and lit them all at once and, and knelt over the flame with the blood pouring out of his mouth and then swallowed the flame there oh. at midnight in this little uh, place out in a swamp on the Mississippi-Louisiana border. And uh, it was a stuff of... Uh, uh, B horror movies and everything that, uh, as a child growing up, that went bump in the night, it was all uh, all there that night. And, uh, and I prayed a lot that night, and uh, by the grace of God, I uh, was delivered. You originally began this path, I suspect, with the intention of just trying to preserve certain laws and try to do good in the world. And yet, uh, what little I know about your story, by the end of this hour, I know I'm going to know a lot more, but you would bump up against mortality in a lot of different ways, and you just made reference to faith. Oh, sure. uh, I was raised uh, in the church, but I would say, uh, in hindsight now, I was a nominal Christian, uh, a professing Christian, not a confessing Christian, and really didn't understand what it meant to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's no no knock on my church. It's just the way it was. And uh, so Ghostly, one of the, Ghostly has many threads in it. And one important thread in this book is One Man's Search for God. And it will continue. This is uh, first in a trilogy. And I'm working on the sequel now when I can find a moment called A Rented World. That's all this is for those of us pilgrims just passing through. But uh, there's no doubt during the uh, Ghostly days that uh, God... uh, uh, had his hand on me. I just didn't understand it, and I ran from it. I was afraid of it. But uh, why he, afraid? 
What was the uh, fear? Uh, it was hard to say. I would guess uh, because uh, uh, probably in the church when I grew up, uh, you know, he probably was this image of this, you know, this gray-haired uh, old guy, you know, and uh, who you, you know, you just didn't want to mess with his wrath or whatever. And uh, so uh, uh, it, uh, I just figured that, well, he had a lot of important things to do, and I'll just take care of these things on my own. And, uh, and uh, but uh, he, uh, you'll see in the book uh, that he dr- intervenes dramatically, uh, especially one, one thing in the book that's fictionalized uh, is based on uh, what happened to us. We were uh, ambushed by men and I were doing a, uh, a heroin deal, and we didn't know that they had a, a sniper sitting on a railroad trestle um, uh, with a high-powered rifle. And uh, when we went to arrest his Confederates, he opened fire on us, and uh, a terrible gun battle ensued, and he, uh, but God inter- intervened very dramatically uh, then. And, uh, you know, in all these book signings I've been on, uh, I've been re- reunited with many of uh, the agents of those days, and, you know, 30-something uh, years ago, uh, I've been able to tell them things that happened uh, that I knew they probably weren't ready to hear then. I was not sure I was in and, and, and the way that God intervened and why we had to do certain things uh, and— uh, uh, so it's just been a really a blessing to sit down with these agents and uh, find out that the ones who survived, that many of them, like me, have been subdued uh, by the Lord in the intervening years, and uh, now we understand what was pretty much beyond us in those days. Merle Temple is in studio. He's written a book entitled The Ghostly Shade of Pale. It's a fiction story, and uh, it's safe to say some of those stories that are fiction are based on things that he has actually experienced in his life. He is also a graduate of the DEA Academy in Washington during the early days of President Nixon's first drug wars. Merle, looking back now, 40 years uh, from this point, with uh, the state of our country now as it applies to the topic of drugs and the DEA, how far have we come to get down to the root of some of these problems? Well, I even we said, even in those days, that uh, combating uh, the drug problem uh, was like trying to dam up the Mississippi River with a shovel. And uh, but there are just so many uh, ports of entry. As, l- as long as there is uh, such high demand, uh, someone's going to fill that demand. Uh, I am a bit concerned now and then when I see what uh, has transpired from the 70s when we were in drug enforcement until today, and just in general. Uh, Because I think, uh, you know, you always have to balance uh, your desire to combat problems like drugs with with liberty, civil liberties and the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. And uh, so I think that's something we need to think about uh, constantly, about uh, 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 worrying about uh, the people who would ask us to uh, give up a little bit of liberty here and a little bit there and turn for security and like... Franklin said, you may soon, you, you soon find you have neither. That's right. Merle Temple is here, author of the book, A Ghostly Shade of Pale. We continue with this, the Frank Sontag Show. On the other side, Merle, I'm going to ask you to share specifically your, um, your walk with Christ when that all dramatically changed. This is the Frank Sontag Show on 99.5 KKLA. 99.5 KKLA, this is the Frank Sontag Show. My guest is a man that I've spent all of about 15 minutes with. We had a brief conversation a couple of weeks ago. We may tell that story as how this interview actually occurred, which is pretty interesting in and of itself. But my guest is a, um, a man who spent many years in law enforcement as a DEA agent. Um, he is also a, um, well, in the early drug wars in the 70s under President Nixon's administration, Merle Temple spent a lot of time trying to preserve some of those rights and catch some of the bad guys, if you will. He's written one of uh, three books, soon to be three books, A Ghostly Shade of Pale. Merle Temple is my in-studio guest. So let me ask you, Mr. Temple, you and I are both men that love Jesus Christ. So let's roll up our sleeves for a moment here, and let's talk about his glory and how it's undeniable how he works in the lives of people who completely surrender to him, which is a difficult thing because we have will, we have free will. Tell me about Merle Temple and your surrender to Christ. 
Well, Frank, I have to say that uh, most of my life, as I said earlier, I knew I had favor with God, but I didn't understand it. And uh, so I was determined to uh, be the, uh, the best I could be. I was in a full works-based salvation mode. Uh, did not understand really the fundamentals of the whole story. And uh, it was only uh, until later in my life, actually after the days in drug enforcement, when I was in the corporate world and, and, uh, and also involved in many political campaigns, uh, when I came out of the uh, law enforcement days, I wanted to... Uh, to uh, fight good and or evil, and uh, and uh, so I got into a lot of political campaigns. Uh, was a state criminal justice chairman for President Reagan in Mississippi. Got to meet President Reagan, be along with him uh, back in uh, 1980, right before the uh, the election. And so I ran in a lot of those circles, and uh, really uh, I was doing well in the corporate world and in the political world too, on the side. And I, I won many awards. And they were just stacking up, but uh, and I kept thinking, I guess uh, if I won enough of those awards, finally that I might be worthy, and not understanding at all. And uh, but uh, I, I got so many of those awards, they were just actually meaningless after a while. And I was searching and searching. I always said I was searching, uh, not for that simplicity on this side of complexity that uh, that many, if not most, people settle for. But I, I said I would strain and burst through complexity to find uh, that simplicity on the far side of complexity, never knowing all the time it was Jesus Christ who was right there with me. And then, as it will be told in the second and third books, uh, Humpty Dumpty took a mighty fall, and uh, and uh, then uh, I was alone in, uh, in a period of my life, and a lot of my so-called friends were not there, and uh, I was broken. The Lord uh, broke me uh, and uh, began to tear the old man down to the ground and build up the new man, and he began to uh, uh, make uh, what I thought was unknowable knowable to me, uh, and uh, Scripture I thought I knew. I found out I didn't understand it all. Oh, yeah. And, uh, just, uh, and then the day came when even in the midst of crushing pain, that I was able to tell him um, uh, that all I wanted, Lord, was just to show me the threads of good and your purpose that you've woven into these blankets of crushing pain so that I might be a better servant. And when I crossed those thresholds, um, I found out what I pray that everybody finds out uh, before it's too late. Uh, The greatest free gift in the world a knowing, a peace, a joy that I never had, no matter how many awards and accolades I got uh, from uh, from the world, uh, it's all as nothing. And people ask me now, some quietly ask me, they said, Merle, is he real? And I said, he is the only thing that is real in my life. Merle Temple is in studio, author of the book, A Ghostly Shade of Pale. You You share that story. And um, I just want to ask you directly, how hard was it to completely submit to him and finally just say, okay, I completely give up to you? Oh, it was hard uh, because uh, I was so independent, a very independent person, a perfectionist, a little OCD, maybe a lot OCD. Uh, So uh, there were a lot of times where I said I was going to do it, and I promised him I was, and I would uh, go up and nail a lot of that bad stuff on the cross to leave it there, but then I would sneak back and take it down again. And then uh, and then one day uh, it came to that point where I just crawled. I crawled to the foot of the cross and said, Lord, I have, I have ruined this life. May I have another? And that's when grace just poured out on me from his wounded side, and he showed me who and what uh, never mattered and who and what always will. The notion of writing these, uh, this, these three books, this trilogy, um, you are strongly compelled not only from your experiences, but obviously these are Christian books. You, you, you want to convey a message about his glory. Can you talk more about that? Well, in writing the book, uh, I wanted to write a book about all of this, uh, but I wanted to write a book that was 
uh, good enough, hopefully, that uh, the secular world would, would take notice of it. And, and, and it's okay for us to write books for each other uh, and preach to the choir, maybe, but uh, I wanted it to, to have a wider uh, view than that. And so far, uh, with the Lord's help, uh, as I said, he's out in front of us now opening doors everywhere that I never could open. Uh, it's just amazing. Everything that people have told me so far will never happen. Well, it's happened. And it's because uh, uh, of that relationship and because the Lord is out there and he has blessed the telling of this story. And there's a lot of pain uh, uh, in these stories, especially in book two and three. Uh, And uh, I don't know any other way as a writer to be authentic than to go back and dig up bones and and embrace all the pain uh, and the joy and the happiness there and, and the grief and the disappointments in yourself at certain times, or embrace all of that to make it real. And I wanted these books to be something that would speak to people when they read them, not just a who done it or a shoot them up, right. get to the action in a throwaway type thing. And uh, Jim Clemente at Criminal Minds, who endorsed the book uh, uh, for us, uh, said he calls this a big crime story as literature. And that's one reason I wrote it as literature also, so it would be enduring, hopefully. And so the reviews that we've just been we've been getting are just uh, heartwarming, uh, just uh, so thankful uh, for the reviews that are coming in from everywhere. Uh, and uh, as I was telling some ladies earlier, actually our best reviews are from women uh, f- uh, for this book. And uh, it's a book where it's a thinking person's book. And uh, uh, Clemente says people that uh, women particularly like it because I write to the senses. And uh, you arrive at some places where you think you've never been, and when you get there sometimes in this book, you find the people there are not strangers, and you round a bend with Michael Parker, the central character, and sometimes you just you bump into yourself long ago, and you, and you think, I didn't know anybody ever felt that way but me. And uh, so you see Michael and his struggles uh, as uh, he is searching uh, for for eternity and not just knowing quite how to get there, but God's hand on him all the time, and uh, so it's uh, it's been a long and winding road, uh, Frank, to uh, to lead me home. My guest is Merle Temple, author of the book A Ghostly Shade of Pale. We will continue with Merle in a matter of moments here on the Frank Sontag Show on ninety nine point five KKLA. 99.5 KKLA, this is the Frank Sontag Show. You recognize this guy, Merle? Oh, I love that bumper music. That's, uh, yeah, he's like family back in Tupelo. And, uh, and actually, there's an Elvis thread in the book, too. Set in old Tupelo in Memphis in the 70s. So there's an Elvis thread in the book also. Let me reintroduce you. Merle Temple is here, author of the book, A Ghostly Shade of Pale. Interestingly enough, off the air, as we are about to come out, you were sharing an Elvis story. Oh. Uh, well, I was just saying that, uh, that there is an Elvis thread and a ghost of shade of fail and because the book is set in old people in Memphis in the 70s and, uh, and uh, as backdrop and flavor, uh, uh, I told some folks, how could I write about that period and us moving around up in that area without, uh, without uh, talking about Elvis because uh, his presence was, uh, you know, uh, was everywhere in those days. And I was mentioning to you on the break that... Um, that uh, I have a lot of a lot of friends all around the world on Facebook uh, who who are big Elvis fans. And one morning, uh, Judy, my wife, and I were she was on her computer and I was on mine. And I get a PM from a, a, um, a young lady who really wasn't even born uh, when Elvis died, but she's in her twenties. But she's crazy about Elvis. And, uh, and this is a young lady who's in a in Buddhist country. And uh, she PM me and uh, she said, "Good morning, sir." She always calls me sir, and I said, "Good morning." Uh, and uh, she said, sir, you know where I love Elvis Presley? And I said, yes, I, I know you do. And she said, well, sir, I hear he loved uh, Jesus Christ. Would you talk to me about Jesus Christ? Mm. And so I get a lump in my throat. And I look at Judy, and she's got a little tear in her eye. And, uh, and so I began to witness to her uh, through Facebook, live to the other side of the world in Thailand, to witness to her about Jesus Christ via the bridge of Elvis Presley. And I think uh, only God can do such things. And, uh, and uh, I shared a story with her about when Elvis was playing at Notre Dame in 1974, always to sold out arenas. And s- some young ladies there had decided to 
have their big moment and they had a banner and they bought tickets uh, all the way across the floor and at their moment came and they stood up and unfurled this big banner that said uh, Elvis uh, you're the king and Elvis stopped on stage that day and said no there's only one king Jesus Christ and so that's the story I shared with her and later I saw her going through my through my page, my timeline, liking different pictures. And one she liked was a picture of Calvary Baptist Church, a beautiful church where Judy and I I go. And she made a little note saying, I'd like to attend this church. Oh, praise God. Praise God. It's amazing. Our God is amazing. He is. He really is. Now, you find yourself in the KKLA studios. This is kind of a a strange story, a a kind of a fun story. I, I didn't know who you were a couple of weeks ago. Tell our listeners what happened. Well, I was coming out to do the signing at uh, the Lifeway store here in Brea. We'll be there Saturday from 10 to 6, and I encourage everybody to come see us if you can. Uh, and uh, some people have mentioned to me about KKLA, and they said, well, you should try to get on there. And I think they probably thought that was probably a long shot. But I looked at the at your website, and, uh, and I didn't see any at first, didn't see any producer uh, contacts or anything like I usually look for and so well I'll just look at the host and uh, so I looked at all the uh, the the great looking handsome and beautiful host you have here on KKLA and uh, and I was looking scrolling down and uh, uh, the Holy Spirit just pointed you out Frank and just said that's the one and so I began to look everywhere I could and uh, dug around finally found out you had a Facebook page and I went there and I said well uh, so I'm just going to send Frank a private message, and I did. And within within 30 minutes or less, you had called me from KKLA to tell me you never look at that Facebook page. That's right. The producer always does, and I think you said you weren't even supposed to be in at that time of the day. That's right. And everything, and I think I told everybody since then, I said, I think Frank and I both knew that in there it was a God thing. So here we are, two fleshly men, sinners that we are, saved by his grace and the cross, how can we, brother to brother, share with the listeners? And I know you're here to talk about the book. That's obviously part of the formatics, but how can we convey to the listeners? Some may not even know about him that are hurting and lost and, and feel as if there's no hope. How can we as brother to brother share with him about his forgiveness and about his uh, redemption and about truly, like Alva said, the only reason why we're here in this life is to talk about him and share his goodness and glory. Well, it's, it's always a struggle, and I have some people who tell me that they get discouraged because they witness to people and they, 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 uh, they find themselves inadequate. Uh, they think they're failing. And I tell them that what I have learned is uh, that this is his time, not ours. And even though you're aiming over here, he may have you aiming over to the side to somebody else who's just listening, maybe not even the person that, uh, that, you're, that you're aiming at. And, and I was talking with somebody recently who, who was not a believer, and he was, he was uh, not very nice uh, about Christians or about me in that particular case. And, uh, and he, uh, he was full of a, lot of, uh, of a lot of hate and mainly pain, I think, and uh, and I find that when you talk to people, that uh, when you witness to people in love, in real love, and you don't respond as they might want you to respond in kind, you know, with anger and hate, uh, they're quite uh, confused. And because uh, I, asked, I asked this one man, why are you so angry? I said, it's someone you, you say does not exist. And I said, I think I know because you miss him. You long for him, and down deep, you know he's the only thing that can fill up that big old hole in your heart. And then he came back and he said, "Well, you, you Christians, you, you just all think you're all so much better than the rest of us." Mm. I said, "Oh no, oh no, we don't." I said, "We, we know we're not." I said, "I understand you because I once was you," and I told him, "I said I hear no love in your communication with me. I hear no love at all, but I love you." because Christ loved me when I thought I was unlovable. Merle Temple is in studio. He's written the book, A Ghostly Shade of Pale. I want to circle back to one thing you said, then we'll really talk about the book in closing here. You mentioned you were scrolling down the KKLA site with all these really handsome men, and then you found me. Were you kind of alluding that I've got a face for radio? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, uh, Frank, uh, it really wasn't what I was saying. <laughs> I think it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, I thought it was Tell Us of Alice at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is true. I, I'm never on that site. I'm never in that, uh, in our Facebook page. And I was sitting in the office early in the day and the, the message popped up and there you were. And I'm like, okay, who's Merle Temple? And then as I read the uh, email you sent me, I was just, you had your number there. I was just drawn to call you. And we had a wonderful conversation and here you are in our studios and I'm just really grateful for you and your witness and your story. Um, have you always had a penchant to write? I have. I, uh, I, I have written many things in my life, uh, technical papers, uh, op-ed pieces, a lot of speeches for political candidates. Yeah, I was going to ask about and, that. Uh, and, and things of that nature. Uh, and people would always say, well, you know, you, know, you, you have a gift. But I found that the, the novel thing is altogether different. Uh, it's it's difficult. It's a different process. Learning how to speak in other voices, other tenses, um, to make sure that uh, your readers can visually see what's happening to the characters, uh, see and feel what they're they're feeling, hear what they're hearing, uh, smell what they're smelling, to actually be there. And that's what so many people tell us: the book is so visual. And that's one thing we strive for. And also, to it's a big and complex book, as Jim Clemente says, to arrive at the end of the book over a period of many years and to make sure that all the complex threads and relationships all arrive at the same place with integrity and uh, that the ages are right, the nicknames are right, the relationships are right, and uh, that you're not confusing something that happened 300 pages ago uh with somebody else and so it's it was a tricky thing and uh, and many times i laid it down walked away from it and thought it was it was terrible and uh you just get so tired of it but then i would come back to it and and uh the holy spirit would always come to me when i was stuck and when i yielded uh to the holy spirit he would just pour things through me and it was all i could do to keep up then as fast as i could go while it was flowing and uh so that's that's another reason why if i wasn't doing what makes me happiest i would be back at uh on my keyboard now on my word processor just uh seeing what the lord had to to pour through me and the sequel is bursting to get out mm. Merle Temple is here author of the book a ghostly shade of pale if you'd like to call Merle if you have any questions or comments about anything that's been stated about Merle about the book Phone numbers are open, 888-995-KKLA, 888-995-KKLA. Any questions or comments from my in-studio guest, Merle Temple? We will continue with this, The Frank Sontag Show on 99.5 KKLA. 99.5 KKLA, this is The Frank Sontag Show. My guest is Merle Temple. He's written a book, the first in a trilogy called A Ghostly Shade of Pale. We've been talking a bit about um, about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and how he has uh, been with us through our whole lives without us even knowing it until we finally got out of our own pride-filled ways and submitted. And uh, Merle's been telling me story after story off the air about your book signing and people that have come up to you and shared uh, just remarkable stories of of God's love. For those that may want to read this book, Tell me the single reason by which you decided to begin this trilogy and write a fiction story, because you even said before you've written a lot, even for a lot of political candidates, but this is a, this is a little different endeavor. So my sense is this is less about Merle Temple and more about another mission. Or oh, it's totally about that. It's not about me at all. And uh, I would say, I guess, Frank, that uh, – uh, I woke up one day, and like Chuck Colson said, I realized that uh, my Savior wouldn't be arriving by Air Force One. And that's when, uh, that's when I went under new management uh, who can't be impeached and won't resign. And it all, it all became about uh, him and uh, uh, me just being as pitiful and frail as I am, a vessel, being the best witness for him and servant that I, that I could be. And uh, since uh, I crossed that threshold, uh, life has been oh so good. 
and I just wish that for everybody. I, I really do, and, and and I pray. I've had people approach me and um, and ask me in earnest uh, uh, about uh, my faith, and and I always pray that I will be adequate. That uh, the Lord will give me the words, you know, because that's the most important thing that you can ever do. What, what else could we ever do that would be more important than leading just one? person to jesus christ and then he takes over you know all we do is just plant the seed and and point the direction but uh, uh what, what else could we ever do that would be be more important than that i can't imagine now you came out from mississippi on a road trip if you will talk a bit about how you got out here and um saturday you will have uh, a book signing I'll, I'll share with my listeners at the end how if they want to come see you say hi and get a book signed they can do that you'll be in brea but how was the road trip out here, and how was Southern California? Well, the road trip was uh, great. It's a long ways from Tupelo here, and uh, our uh, Nissan Murano was uh, loaded down with so many books and other stuff <laughs> that it was just the sh- there was no shocks uh, left when you hit pops. It's just clop, clop, clop. And uh, but uh, gosh, we, uh, we we met so many nice people along the way. Saw such beautiful uh, country. Uh, across the fruited plains of America, and uh, had always wanted to come into Southern California, and had not before. And so when we came down from Barstow, uh, where we stopped, and came across the desert and came down here, where we were just wild and uh, and just such uh, such pretty country down here, and uh, the people are real nice that we've encountered so far they, they think i talk a little funny but uh, i think they do <laughs> and so it's just it's just been uh, it's just been quite a quite a blessing and uh we hope to go back uh, perhaps up to las vegas to see friends and have a signing as we uh, go back and uh, see new territory now you have said this is the first in a trilogy and you can't wait to get back to the processor and start up so you have two more books that you have a vision of, if you will, how long will it take you in your, in your perspective of things to actually write those two books? How long of a period of time are we talking about? Well, a rented world, which I've written five chapters on, if I just had the time right now because we're so busy on promotion for Ghostly, if I had the time, I think I could probably have the first draft out within two to three months. Uh, again, when I sit down and write, and I, I kind of feel it bursting to get out now, and the, the Lord just begins to pour stuff through me. Uh, you know, people ask me, are you supposed to budget so much time a day as a writer yeah. and yeah. all that? And I said, not for me. I said, uh, I sit down when when the Lord is downloading from above. Uh, that's when I begin to, to write and try to keep up. And uh, I may do 100, 200 pages you know, uh, before it stops. And, and those are the best things. If you sit there all day and try to force it, it's not going to be very very good but if you if you yield to him and to his approach and let him guide you it's going to be something pretty special and uh so as i was telling you off air uh, the best part of the, uh, on this journey is meeting so many nice people along the way and making so many friends who begin to follow us on facebook uh, we have church at some of these signings we praise the lord and we're reunited with people we hadn't seen in so very long and make so many new friends too and uh and they've taken such ownership in this whole process of the book and and supporting and praying for judy and for me as we travel across america and we tell our story and and they know that uh that we are on a on a much bigger mission and that is to just meet people and uh and i hope when they meet me and look into my eyes uh, i hope they see the light of jesus christ and and maybe they'll ask me wow how did you get that? I want some of that, too. Yeah. <laughs> Merle Temple is in studio. Let me read a little bit off the back cover of his, uh, of his fiction novel. Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics Captain Michael Parker is an unlikely player in a struggle for the soul of America. A ghostly pale embodiment of evil becomes his obsession, and his tormentor leaves a trail of bodies across the South. It goes on to talk. And this is a ghostly shade of pale. Merle Temple is the author. You can see Merle this Saturday in Brea. He'll be doing a book signing at Lifeway Bookstore, uh, 2535 East Imperial Highway from 10 to 6. Merle also made mention of Facebook. He is on Facebook at Merle Temple. Merle is M-E-R-L-E, 
There's another Merle with that first name spelled like that. Well, it's Merle like Harrogate and and, uh, uh, Temple like Shirley, I always say. (laughs) Merle, it's great to meet you. I'm glad you made it out here safely. Continue uh, safe travels. Thank you for the book. Thank you for your witness and for your love for um, for Jesus Christ. I just um, I'm uh, wishing you many good prayers for the book and. Thank you for being on KKLA today on my program. Uh, it's a blessing to be here with you, Frank. You're a good man. Thank you so much. I'm only saved by his grace. I'm a fool. Let's get it straight. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. <laughs> Merle Temple has been my guest. We will continue with this, the Frank Sontag Show.